Hello, whiskey folk, and welcome to another No Nonsense Whiskey Live. It's a extremely hot room today, so I, I apologise massively if I'm very red faced. Uh, I've also been decorating all day today, so uh, truly exhausted is not the word. But um, we're going to crack on with the heat in this room. Of my big light up here is not doing me any favours, but it's all about having the well lit room. Today is a very special live. Um, I've got a very awesome guest to share with you guys today, but I'm just going to say hello to people in the chat and then we'll get uh, Dan in. So today we've got Kresmir in. Thank you very much. You were in early, so thank you very much. McCallum Finalware, nice one, Doc. Good to see you in. Um, he's saying that uh, he just bought two Germany exclusives of Cotswolds and then sent them back to England for someone who's collecting. So that's uh, that's funny. Good like round trip for that. Uh, we've also got uh, Whiskey Smoky Barbecue. Nice. Three things that I like a lot. Uh, we've also got Lee J. Browning. Thank you very much for coming in. And Mark Slinger. Thank you very much, guys, for joining. Uh, I'm going to pull Dan in straight away because we uh, want to talk about some awesome whiskeys and uh, get the ball rolling. So let me pull Dan in. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? Hey, everyone. How are you? Good to see you. <laughs> and you and you so for those that don't know uh, and if you don't then where have you been of course but this is uh, daniel shaw or uh, you know hopefully i'm i can call you dan but <laughs> if you prefer daniel that's fine as well yeah but um this is uh dan shaw of the cotswolds distillery founder and ceo uh, i've had the pleasure of uh, meeting and talking with you several times over the years since you started but today we're going to be talking about all things cotswolds I've got the uh, Sauternes cask already in my glass, but I've got a nice little selection here as well, as I think you have. I do too. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I just popped in the chat as well. We might be having some audio issues, so please bear with us. Um, if uh, if we have to do some repeated questions or anything, it's not, no problem at all. We'll just um, crack on. But if anyone's got any questions for Dan at any point, just let me know. Uh, I think I saw one earlier, um, but we'll crack into that at some point later on. Um, but uh, all I wanted to do to start with, Dan, is to say uh, thank you very much for coming on. And um, how has it been going for you over the last few weeks? Obviously, it's been very busy for me being at home, but a lot of people not at home uh, or are at home and not been able to work. How's it been for you? Yeah, well, it's, thank you again for having me, Ben. It's, it's always a pleasure. You're one of our favorite you know, uh, fans and friends um, and your local um, I think we have the same postcode. We, we share a CV postcode. Um, and uh, and so it, it's always great. Um, and so thank you all for tuning in and you're live from my guest room, uh, which is a lot less interesting than uh, usually when I do a Zoom call, I got a background of the distillery so you can see the stills behind me. Now all you see is is the guest room bed um, and all my, uh, my Zoom shirts that are hanging up there. Um, because as we all know, all you need is a nice shirt for a video conference these days, don't you? So we got a choice of them up there. Um, but um, things have been odd, um, but kind of okay. Um, you know, we everything started happening around mid March, and we, you know, as as a lot of folks may know, uh, we've always taken a real interest in having as many people come and see us as possible, and really see for themselves what the story is about, how we make our spirits. And we run three tours a day, seven days a week. And we have, in addition to the distillery shop, we have boutiques in Borton on the Water and Broadway, and they're usually pretty full. Easter time, that would have been just when things were picking up. And then all of a sudden, this happened. So I think mid March, we had to cancel the tours. And a week later, we just had to shut the shops and the cafe. I mean, we have a brand new visitor center that, you know, celebrated its one year anniversary, April 17th, being shut, um, which is just a pity because it's a really beautiful place and people. You know, we're really enjoying the cafe and just basically the chilled out kind of club vibe there. And so uh, all of the admin and the sales and marketing guys are all kind of working from home. Um, however, you know, we are still in production um, and we never stopped being in production, actually. So we kept on making whiskey throughout. Um, what we did do is we went from our usual kind of pretty punishing uh, double shift seven days a week. We are one of the hardest working little distilleries out there because of the size of our kit. We have to kind of make up for that. Um, we do a half ton mash. So we have a two and a half thousand liter wash still and about a 15, 1600 liter spirit still. Uh, but we run those 14 hours a day, seven days a week. So we do a morning mash and afternoon mash seven days a week. Um, and we stopped doing that, I guess it was the beginning of April. Um, and we went to single shift seven days a week. Um, and that was basically just our 
thinking, you know, maybe we need to sort of save cash a little bit um, because obviously it costs a lot of money to make whiskey. Um, uh, and it actually costs more to make less whiskey. Um, but on the other hand, it doesn't cost, you know, it, it, you save a little bit of cash. And these days it's all about, you know, survival and kind of making sure that we're okay. So, so we've probably, I think our net number of casks in storage went up by about 50 rather than hundred in, in April and same thing in May. And now we're debating whether we go back to double, double shift in, in June. Um, and then we've also kept all of our bottling going because it's all been about getting as much stock out there into our warehouses where we could get it out to trade and on our own website, which has been doing great. Um, so it's been kind of the same mixed bag as a lot of folks. Shops closed, but internet sales doing great. Um, restaurants and bars closed, but the you know, likes of sort of Waitrose Nocato and Amazon doing a lot better. Um, uh, and in the middle of all that, we've released a new gin, a new whiskey, and then last weekend we released a new uh, whiskey liqueur, our first whiskey liqueur, uh, our whiskey Amaro. So uh, uh, it's been it's been busy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I've I've I think I've only missed now. Um the summer festival whiskey that's the only whiskey i didn't didn't get for literally no reason at all it just passed me by um but i bought the gin recently as well because um uh, my, my wife's expecting but she wanted a nice treat for when she was actually able to drink and i was like i'll get you this because that, that it looks beautiful i don't like gin myself but it looks beautiful um the packaging and the red flavor red color of it all so um hopefully she enjoys that when she's able to drink it <laughs> it certainly looks fabulous well we we seem we seem to like we seem to like red things at the Cotswolds Distillery because it's funny. I happen to have the new wildflower gin here, um, mm. which, as you can see, is pretty red. Yeah. But get this, and this is the bottle that you don't have. This is actually our port cask, the one that you don't have, the festival release. And um, it's, it's almost as red as the, the gin. Um, and you know, the funny story behind why this port cask uh, is this festival release, which we did because we had this music festival last, last August, which we probably won't be able to do again this year. But the story was we got a shipment of port season casks in from uh, Diaz, who's our Cooper, um, the guys who make our SDR casks, our shaved, toasted, and recharged wine casks in Portugal. And so since they're in Portugal, um, in Espino, which is a town that does all the cooperage, or used to do all the cooperage for, for the port trade, we figured they would be the best guys to ask for some port casks. And they sent us, I think, two dozen port casks. And they came with a lot of transport port, as they call it, basically a little you know, port to keep in the barrel to keep the barrels moist. So um, didn't know what to do with all this port in the barrels. And I didn't know who to ask. I called Jim Swan, who's our, our wonderful mentor, our, the late Jim Swan. And I said, Jim, um, what do you do with the port that comes to you in the barrel? And he said, well, if you're in Scotland, you know, um, SWA rules, you'd have to dump that out because you're not allowed to have anything. But, the, you know, but he said, you're not in Scotland, you're in England. So I'd keep it in there if I were you. But I don't think he knew just how much Port was in those barrels. And to our amazement, six months later, we found that we had, you can see it there in the light, we had like red whiskey. Um, so it's a bit of a novelty item. It's really got a lot of that port taste. It's a lot of raisins going on, a lot of sort of sultana. Um, for those who have a bit of a sweet tooth and like it, it's really nice. It's almost out um, because we did, I think, a cask, maybe a cask and a half. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, we thought that would sell out at the festival, but, you know, it was, uh, we're in a nation of gin drinkers. And uh, so, so we didn't see as many bottles of whiskey go at the festival as we expected. So it's still, I think there's a few, few bottles left, but we've got a lot more port casks left. And now we're filling, well, we filled, I think, two or three lots of port cask since then. And the next ones we didn't leave the port in. So there would be a little bit less red, but still very porty. We, by the way, are big believers in full-term maturation. We don't do finishing uh, at Cotswolds Distillery. We believe that, um, you know, the casks can make whiskey very interesting, but why not just plop the new make in there from day one um, uh, rather than have it in a third fill or refill, fourth fill, whatever kind of old dead bourbon cask for years and years and years and then just put it in something to flavor it. Let's just go the whole way. And um, and so the interesting you know thing is with the with the uh, hearts and crafts is that this was new make into a European oak sauterne seasoned cask, um, which is because it's been in there so long that's why you get more than just the sauterne you get a lot of the oak which is kind of an interesting thing for us because we're we're much more U.S. oak guys this is like our first European oak experiment really and the next one will be coming in October with our sherry cask release. 
Actually, that was one of the questions I had for you um, later, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll may as well get into it now because it's um, the thing about this is that it's going to be a series, isn't it? It's going to be an annual release uh, series, the Hearts and Crafts. Um, and I, I have to say, I really like the new direction on the tin as well. Mm-hmm. Traditionally, your boxes, aren't you? Um, but there was, uh, there was there's one feature of the box. We are the um, the the boxes are uh, when they're folded and shipped. Um, I don't know if I've got an example here. Um, the the uh, no, I haven't. Sorry, uh, but the, the 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 piece of the label that goes around the corner flicks off of the um, of the box. It's a really it's, it looks like you just stick it back down again, but it's just a really weird thing. So I really like this this now this new round tube. Um, but yes, uh, the, 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 the dreaded rabbit ears we call them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so you're you're well aware of them then. <laughs> Yeah, it drives me crazy. I, you know, I, I go off, I go to airports uh, to go you know, with a family to go on holiday or whatever. And my wife and daughter have to wait while I go through duty free and I stick all those little things back on the side. But that will be a thing of the past soon because uh, we're now going to be printing that diagonal strip onto the boxes. So it won't be coming up on the sides. But you know. yeah. but the, the, the tube was basically, I mean, the, the whole concept behind this limited edition was we buy these parcels of casks, which we call specials. Um, our main wood program is probably, I want to say, maybe 35 to 40% uh, bourbon. Um, and that's mainly first fill, but we also now are getting some second fill. We're actually, we're making we're, it's our own second fills because we're emptying them. And so we're, we, we don't think we'll use it past the second fill, but we do think the second fill is important to have because you have to, as you get older and all your flavors get more intense, you need to have a way to dial back uh, the intensity sometimes of the flavor, um, particularly with SDRs because they are so intense. So having a bit of second fill is important. It's it's the hard thing is trying to figure out the right ratio of what to keep because you know you've got to try and figure out what your sales are going to be in three years and five years, etc. Um, but we do 35 to 40 percent bourbon. We do 35 to 40 percent um, STR uh, X X R one cast and about 20 percent sherry. Um, but that extra 10% is for these special casks and, um, we'll try every year to get four or five parcels of like maybe about a half a dozen casks each, um, that are just different. And they range from the crazy, like, you know, when we wanted Calvados casks, they were really hard to come by. Um, so Nick, uh, our distillery manager and I, um, rented a truck, drove down to Portsmouth, got on the boat, went to Le Havre got out, started knocking on doors at Calvados Distilleries, and we came back with 35 Calvados casks that were still fresh, and so we filled those. So that was how we got our Calvados casks. But we've done, you know, the Port, Madeira. Um, we've done, uh, like, the Sauterne. We've done Bagnol, Pinot de Charente, um, Vermouth casks. We've done, um, uh, gosh, just a lot of different – we just we just ordered a bunch of Tokai casks, which are going to be pretty cool, so sweet Tokai wine. Um and so then the question is, well, what do you do with these? And we thought, well, why don't we have a special release once a year where we come out with this small parcel, typically five or six casks, which will make you about 1,500 to 2,000 bucks. Um, and the first one was this uh, heart. And we decided to name it Hearts and Crafts because uh, the Cotswolds was kind of one of the spiritual homes of the arts and crafts movement. Um, uh, William Morris, one of the best known um leaders of the arts and crafts movement um, had his summer home in Chipping Camden, um, about 15 minutes from us. And uh, that whole movement, the values were about return to traditional craftsmanship. It was kind of anti-industrial revolution. Um, it was, you know, make things the right way and return to the land, etc. And that's kind of what we're all about, really, was um, moving out to the country and doing something nice in a traditional kind of way. So we thought that was a good theme. And this is the first year's release and we decided to create these tubes and and do them in william morris wallpaper designs so they'll be different every year yeah they look really nice um we've had a, a really great question uh, come in which is a good place to start really um from a chap called uh, mccallum finery who we all call the doc um, he's said for cotswold's newbie uh, what do you recommend um for me uh obviously the standard release is uh, a great place to start but my my heart lies with the founder's choice. Um, absolutely astounding. Love this stuff. Sixty uh, percent. Mm, um, so uh, for for someone who I think is who's like kind of new to whiskey, I would suggest the the standard release. But for for someone like you, Doc, 
um, who's a, a, a big head in the whiskey world, I, I, I would go straight for the founder's choice, to be honest. Um, what do you think, Dan? What would you suggest? Well, it's a, it's a tough one because, um, you know, on the one hand, our flagship, right, which is this one over here, um, or some people call it uh, uh, the Odyssey Barley, um, but it won't always be Odyssey Barley. In fact, actually, we're now onto Laureate Barley because they, they've changed the varieties, but they call it Odyssey Barley because it says so on the diagonal here, and there's the year of the harvest and the farm. Uh, and for the first couple of years, our farm was on Odyssey. Um, now, as I said, changed to Laureate. But um, our flagship is 70% SDR, 30% first fill bourbon. So you've got a mix of the whole wine cask thing, the rechard wine cask thing, and that nice maltiness and the letting the grain come out that you get with the first fill bourbon. And the idea behind that was to try and find a blend that kind of could be considered to be like what the Cotswolds is all about. And to me, I kind of thought, well, what grows in the Cotswolds? Grain and fruit, basically, right? That's the two things you get, you know, apples and plums and pears and all that. Um, and you get cereals all over the place, um, arables. So um, that was seemed to me to be a good statement of the terroir. And I think it really works well. And my little secret is even though Founder's Choice is on the name of Founder's Choice, um, I get my, you know, it's, it's, it's my choice. It is for a reason I'll get into, but my, Go to uh, when you know I'm getting ready to go upstairs in the bed. My my whiskey moment, baby. You know, kind of being in bed with the wife, the dog, and Netflix and something, and just you know that kind of end of the day. You've got a little dram, and it's just your guilty little kind of contemplative dram, as Michael Jackson used to call it. Um, uh, and I will more than often, more often than not, reach for this simply because it just it kind of just goes down the easiest. Sometimes I, I don't know how to put this but like at the end of the day if you're tired you just maybe don't want a whiskey that's making you think too much i mean i had like a 25 year old port ellen a while back and i was like god this takes a lot of effort to kind of think about understand get through these layers of a lot of wood a lot of leather a lot of you know um this is to me the ultimate comfort food whiskey in a way but having said that the founder's choice you know, was a the story behind this. This is like a real labor of love in that um, before I even had met Jim Swan, who is the who who this whiskey this release is dedicated to. It actually says it on the back because Jim was the inventor of the STR cask. Before I had even met Jim Swan or known that he was going to work with us and be so influential, um, I found myself in July of 2013 at a whiskey tasting evening at the Maison de Whiskey shop in Paris. And I used to live in Paris back in 2000. That's kind of where I got into whiskey. And they used to have a club back then at that shop. Uh, and every month they would go to the club. And the guy who kind of ran the club was this great guy, Jean-Marc, who's been there for 25 years. He's run that shop. And um, then I left Paris and I hadn't been back for a long time. I got back in 2000 and I was just there for literally one night, 2013. These friends took me along for a tasting night that they'd won at an auction. And there was Jean-Marc and he remembered me or said he remembered me um, from 13 years ago. And uh, not many of his old club club geeks, um, uh, uh, not, he didn't have enough influence on most of them that they would actually go off and create a distillery. But I said, Jean-Marc, I'm going off to create a distillery. And he just launched into this. He's He kind of was like my Mr. Miyagi kind of, you know, it was like, you know, the wax on, wax off kind of, you know, and he, um, he, took me through a tasting, which were three of the most influential whiskeys uh, that uh, that I had tasted at that point. And two of them were Chichibu and Cavalan. And the Cavalan that I tasted was their Vigno Barrique, which is their STR, 100% STR cast strength release. And I'd never tasted a whiskey like that. It just had everything I loved. It had, it was like Armagnac meets bourbon meets single malt. It just had this great, taste this moorishness about it and almost a savoriness to it an umami that just made you just kind of want to keep on drinking it and, I, and and he said you know how old do you think this is I, I have no idea he said it's four years old and it's from taiwan and that completely blew my mind and from then on um until it won uh, the cavalan won the world's best single malt i used to always have a bottle of it and i used to pour it for my friends who knew nothing about world whiskey and make them try and guess where it was from and how old it was. And they would say, oh, it's a 
sherry bomber, wine, 15 years old, 20 years old. I said, no, it's from Taiwan, it's four years old. It was kind of my little parlor trick game, which I can't do anymore because it's like 200 quid a bottle and I can't afford it. But um, I then found out that that was a whiskey that was 100% STR. And so we decided to do this after a really nice tasting with the guys from the Soho Whiskey Club in London, who actually came up about 20 of them. And we were doing a tasting of different casks and they just said, you have to do this. You have to release this as a 100% STR edition. And it was October, it was September of 2018. And in record time, I mean, in less than two months, we got the labels and we brought it out in time for Christmas. So I do love this, to, that's a long answer to your short question, but, um, it is very potent. It's like 60.9 ABV. So it really packs a punch. Um, I don't personally find myself able to really enjoy it at that, like right out of the bottle. I need to get it down to about 55 or so. So a little bit of water just opens it up. You get that length. And then you just kind of fall in love with it as you're sipping it. So, you know, the flagship is easier, but this is, you know, definitely you know, kind of where my heart is, I guess. Yeah, well, that's good, actually, because that's kind of like um, answered a question from Facebook as well, from Amy Seaton. I'm sure you you know who Amy is, um, the owner of the Whiskey Club in Birmingham. So I'm glad to see she's coming in on Facebook, uh, which is your favourite expression since opening. Um, my favourite story about the uh, founder's choice uh, is that uh, maybe it was I think it was last year. I helped out at the uh, Birmingham Whiskey Festival, just setting up and whatnot. Um, but you, uh, you had a Cotswolds guy there who was on his own um and needed a break to go and do a tasting um so he wasn't even going for like lunch or whatever he was going away from the stand to end it so he said do you want to cover the stand for an hour and i was like easy i can cover the cotswell stand no problem and all you mm -hmm. had was the standard release and the founders and i just talked about them for when people come up but the best story some guy just came out of nowhere and just said i've heard i need to try the blue one and just went and, and so I'm like, fine there you go i'll give you the blue one and he just walked off just like whoa this is amazing which is incredible like, he didn't even really know what he what he was going for he just knew it someone had told him get the blue one um so it was going around the just the um the floor about this this blue this blue one yeah and yeah i completely agree with that it, when i when i first tried it i was like you say it's a it's a huge bomb it's 60 percent. but for me that's that's kind of what i'm aiming for these days like this is this is neat there's no water in that and i just absolutely love it um i love that high abv which is Good at the uh, sort of turns, like you said, about that 55%. So that's sitting nicely as well. Yeah. Well, you know, my, 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 another one of my mentors and idols, kind of Jim McEwen, I'm glad he used to always liken his whiskeys to his kids, you know, the, as you would say, they're your baby. Um, and um, just kind of like you don't say, uh, you know, you, you love all your kids equally. You, you know, I love all of our releases and I've had my moments with all of them. Um, Right now, I have to say, I'm going through an embarrassing amount of Hearts and Crafts. Um, I, I just started really, uh, I mean, I, I finished a bottle kind of on my own, which is not really, I mean, not in a night. It took a couple of weeks, uh, but it was sort of like, you know, the dram and night. And I just kept on wanting to have that because in the beginning, it took me a little while to get my head around European oak, mm -hmm. just because I'm typically not someone who's really into over wooding. Um, I like to let the character, the spirit come through. Um, but once, I don't know, it's weird. It's almost once you kind of adapt to it, then you start to see what's behind it. And I just started getting peaches and mangoes. And I've just been having this peach and mango fest kind of like every night. And I think that the more of the bottle gets drained, um, maybe that's what I'm just telling myself, the more oxidation you get, the more kind of those flavors come out really quickly. But um, I just opened for tonight um, my second bottle of, Arts and Crafts, which is, uh, um, yeah, a gourmandise, as the French say. It's a little bit of a guilty sin, but I'm having a good time. With it. <laughs> Going down a little too easy, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a, a good question that's coming from uh, from YouTube, uh, which is um, Michael Taylor says he loves the founder's choice. Uh, and would I ask which wine was in the STR cask beforehand? Um, obviously, you say on the, on the bottom ah. here that... Uh, uh, it's an oak red wine cask, but maybe it's a mash of a few because you, you uh, deconstruct the, um, uh, the 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 barrels as well, right? Is that correct? Yeah, well, so that's a really good question. It's a question we get asked all the time, particularly in France um, when we're like at Whiskey Live in Paris and people come to the stand and they all want to know which wine. Now, first of all, uh, 
it's actually much more important to know what kind of category of wine and therefore what kind of cask was used than the brand name. I think, uh, to be honest, uh, to be fair, I think there's a fair number of distilleries who've really gotten on the finishing bandwagon and wine casks, and then they would throw out big brand names that's a, matured in a Chateau d'Iquem cask or matured in a Mouton Lafitte or whatever. I, to be honest, that there's a lot of branding going on in there. But the story behind which wine cask the STR uses actually goes much more to the heart of the genius of Jim Swan. Um, because basically when Jim was thinking about the kind of flavors he was looking for, um, he was looking for something that, uh, you know, if what you're doing, so basically the, the, the way that this works is you're shaving a couple mil of the red wine soaked wood off, and then you're toasting the cask for about 30 minutes over low heat, uh, get all those wood sugars caramelized, and then you're setting it on fire for, I guess, about 30 seconds or so, you get a medium char going. And so you're basically, it's a fresh layer of char. So the fresh layer of char already is gonna give you a lot more wood influence, gonna give you more spiciness. And so what Jim, I imagine, was saying to himself was, I don't really want French oak or Spanish oak on top of that, because that's gonna get, give me even more spice, more tannin, more aggressiveness. So what Jim did was he used a wine cask made of American oak. Um, and so what I usually tell people is, I don't know what wines were in these casks, except that I do know that typically they will have been um, uh, Southern European wines and typically Iberian wines, so Spain and Portugal. So I've asked the Cooper this and he says, you know, typically they'll get them from Douro Valley, Portuguese wines, uh, Riocas, Alentejos. Um, because down there where it's very hot, um, winemakers will tend to favor American oak over European oak because they too don't want too much tannin to leach in too quickly. So I thought that was a brilliant idea. Use American oak, but it's had wine in it, and then you rechar it. So you're getting like literally, it's like if a if a bourbon, if a fresh, if a virgin oak bourbon cask married a wine cask, it's like that's the two of them together. And so that's how the STR was was born. Now there's other variations. I know that um, there's a couple of Coopers that have really gotten into STR technology and they're starting to do STR casts that are sherry seasoned, um, Spanish oak STRs. Um, we keep on kind of getting the same ones because we just love them. And there's an incredible consistency. If you taste 10 STRs that have been aged for the same amount of time, um, you know, there'll, there'll be a very, very similar taste profile. And some people have said, and I was on a tasting a little while ago when people said, you know, STRs in some quarters have gotten kind of gotten a bad name because they it's almost like a cheat, you know, it throws in too much cast character and it's you know used by startup distilleries to make their whiskeys taste older more quickly and whatever. To which I say, I, I like the taste. I can't help it. I'm always gonna make this whiskey, even when we're 15 years old, 20 years old, touch wood. Um, I just I think that it's just a brilliant taste. Um on its own in the founder's choice or moderated with a bit of first fill bourbon, uh, as is the case with the flagship. Mm. And I, I remember um, uh, uh, purchasing my bottle, actually, of the of the original bottling. I Long before I started YouTube, um, by the time I actually picked it up, I, I had started YouTube. But when I heard that you, um, you were uh, building a distillery so close to me, I, ha I knew I had to get a bottle. But at the time, kind of new distilleries were a kind of a new thing, especially down here. Um, so we had like, obviously you had the one in Norfolk, but you, I think you were kind of maybe second or third. Um, but I was like, I think I'm probably bigging myself up. But I was like a hundred ninth order or something like that of one of your bottles. Um, but I remember when we came to the festival to pick up the bottle, me and my buddy who had also bought a bottle, we were really enthusiastic, but you know, you were sitting there like, P like, please be good. Please be good. It's got to be good. And we tried it and we were just absolutely astounded like that i mean everyone says the same thing i imagine like i can't believe that this is like three years old or maybe a bit more depending on what you've put in there now but at the time it would have been three years and a little bit um and it's yeah that's that's the the cast influence all all over isn't it the cast choice absolutely astounding well we we were sorry i only got uh, parts of it is because there was a, a bit of a cutting cutting off. But in in terms of cask, um, you know, cask influence, uh, we were we we were extremely lucky to have uh, been been able to work with Jim while he was alive, and and what he gave us in the 
first you know year really uh, was was probably more important. I mean, we we were hoping to be able to have him in every three months for the next ten years to just crack open a couple dozen samples and just look at where things you know go over time. But what was so important was that when we were starting off, I mean, you have basically when you have to decide on a wood program. Um, how do you know where to get your barrels? If you're me, uh, who's never been in the drinks industry before, um, and you have lots of folks sending you in offers. I mean, I kind of was back and forth between worrying, because I had heard at that point, a lot of people saying, oh, it's really hard to get your hands on casks. There's a cask shortage out there. That was, I think, Cooper's trying to talk up cask prices, because there's never, we've never had a problem getting casks, uh, as many as we, we would like. But it was kind of between some people saying it's going to be hard to get, and then other people just you know getting lots of offers from Coopers by email and this and that, and 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 barrel merchants, people selling sort of brokers selling secondhand barrels. And the thing is, is that you know if I hadn't had Jim, we could have been in, had a really kind of haphazard and chaotic way of building our wood program and just taking a little bit from here, a little bit from there, because it's so hard in the beginning to know what kind of expressions you're going to want five years out, ten years out, you know, and um, and it would have taken us a year or two to see whether or not those casts were any good or not. Um, whereas with Jim, you know, basically he said, right, you know, if you're looking for bourbons, you got to call Tim in Louisville. And Tim was a mate of Jim's. He's somebody who Jim knew who uh, was able to get, you know, really great barrels from Brown and Foreman, freshly dumped, still moist, you know, fully assembled, comes come to us in a container. You open the door to that container and the aroma that hits you is just unbelievable. But we've even done one better in that now we're actually getting them from, uh, we're getting a lot of our casks from Beam Suntory for the bourbon, on the bourbon side. And one of the cool things is that they have these premium casks. Um, they cost a little bit more, but that's kind of what we're always about is just trying to get do things as well as we can. And you can get um, Booker's casks and Basil Hayden's casks. Um, and what I like about those premium ones, we get a few Maker's casks as well, but what's really nice about the Booker's and the Basil Hayden's they haven't been steamed to within an inch of their lives. And that's a little secret about what people do in Kentucky is they actually, after they dump the casks, they steam treat them to get that last couple liters of mm -hmm. bourbon out of them. And then that leaves you nothing. Um, whereas these ones aren't steam treated. Um, and so between the STRs, between Jim's contacts and bourbon land, and then on, sh on the Sherry side, I mean, he gave us, uh, an introduction to really one of the most amazing men that I've ever met, uh, Miguel Martin, uh, who has a great pair of bodegas in, in Spain, um, one in Jerez and one in Huelva. Um, and, and Miguel Martin um, provides a lot of the cast that you'll find in McAllen, in, um, I think in, I think in Glen Gronicle, I might be wrong about that, but certainly in Glen Farkless. Um, and uh, he's got an amazing vertical production. So he's basically got his own sawmills, one in Spain and one in Pennsylvania for his American and Spanish oak. He's got his own cooperage, makes his own barrels. He's got his own sherry making uh, facility, which makes massive amounts of all the different types of sherries, the PX, El Rosa, et cetera. And then his own seasoning warehouses and then even his own vinegar factory. So when all that sherry's done after a few years seasoning the cask for whiskey, He'll make sherry vinegar out of it. And uh, we convinced him that uh, we were only 20 minutes off the M40. And when he was coming from Spain up to Scotland, he should just pull off the M40 uh, and drop off 20 or so at a time by us. And uh, and they're just amazing casts. They're, the quality is great. And you'll see in October when we release our first sherry release, you know, we've not, these haven't really been out yet. Although I think I see a bottle of Lord Mayor's Reserve on your table. And that does have one uh, sherry cask in it. Um, but up until now, we haven't used the sherry cast yet. But so this is just a long way of saying that, you know, um, it was really helpful with Jim in terms of being able to get the right wood program and also the protocols for mashing, fermenting, the cuts that we used. You know, these were all things that, that we were greatly helped in. Awesome. Yeah. Um, we have got another question, which is quite kind of cool. Well, um, people know me as a bit of a Cotswolds fanboy, but that pales into comparison to this guy who you might know from the devotees group, which is Billy Saunders. Um, haven't met Billy yet, but uh, it's definitely in the pipe works because he's fairly local to me. Um, he's asking, uh, were you planning to release anything for this year's summer festival that obviously you can't do anymore? Um, like, did you have anything that you, you might, you might have put out for that? Uh, 
It's a good question. It's a really good question. It's so good that, um, to be honest, you've caught me. Um, <laughs> I haven't really thought about it. Um, I, I'll be completely honest, because it's the only way I kind of know how to be, um, is that um, we were a little bit surprised that, I mean, I went off to Isla a few years in a row in a face shield, and I stood in that damn line outside of Lagavulin for my bottle. And, you know, I kind of thought they'd be doing the same thing for ours, but I always have to remind myself, this is a gin drinking nation. Um, and uh, there was a, an awful lot of gin and an awful lot of cocktails and beer and cider drunk at our festival. Um, but um, you know, not all of our festival release was was sold. Um, so I wasn't sure whether or not we would do that again, but I also wasn't sure, to be honest, what we were thinking is, is that we wouldn't do quite as large a festival as we did last year. I think last year it was like 1,500, 2,000 people, um, that this year we were going to do a more intimate kind of festival, like maybe a couple hundred people, and that might not make sense to do a release uh, for. Um, and we had just done the... You know, we've just done the hearts and crafts, whereas last year we didn't have a spring release. We just had a fall release. Um, so I don't know. Um, but I, you know, I could be convinced if somebody's got some ideas. Um, you know, Billy, if you want to come on down, go walk through the warehouse and show you what we got and we can talk. But, uh, um, you know, unfortunately right now, I guess we're kind of debating as to what we're even going to look like this summer. Um, uh, when the shops can reopen, when we can restart tours, and in what way. Um, so we're going to have to kind of wait and follow uh, the world on, on that one. Um, but, um, you know, there's been some talk about maybe that we could do something by way of um, kind of a, a, a release to help benefit um, the NHS and some charities that we, you know, have been helping with with san hand sanitizer and stuff. So maybe we could do, do that as well. Awesome. Remains to be seen. Yeah, absolutely. But I think I think no matter what will happen, um, like I, I always I'm always a big fan of saying, and I'll be completely candid, is um, like a, a distillery's only as good as their their last. It's the same thing, like you're only as good as your last album, right? So, um, but everything every single time I get something from the Cotswolds, it's always um, not necessarily surprising um, because now itself as a as a quality brand, um, which I think is important. But even something like uh, this, like Lord Mayor's Reserve, which I picked up fairly recently, um, forty-six percent. You might immediately think, compared to the sixty, the fifty-five, or this fifty-nine with the peated. You know, but when I tried that, it was you know, again beautiful. Um, so I think you, you know, although yes, yeah, sure, you're only as good as your last whiskey, but you guys are consistently putting out bottles that are um, just that that touch of extra quality, and that's what I always tell people. My comment section is a bit rife people don't trust english whiskey totally yet um and they, they'll say something like is it really worth the money and i'll say well i mean just try one bottle and then you can tell me because yes i think it is but i keep telling people that <laughs> no, that's yeah that's really um, sweet I've, well i can tell you you know in, in in terms of the money it is it is there's a lot of cost involved because boy it costs a lot of money to start a distillery and and it's many many years until you'll ever see a return from it. We're, we're certainly not there yet because, I mean, we're making, you know, we, we make a million pounds worth of whiskey every year that we just, you know, that goes straight into casks. So basically you got to find that amount every year. Um, and so it'll be a couple of years uh, until there, there's a return. And until then it, it is hard in terms of the pricing. We've always tried to keep pricing as reasonable as we could. Um, we sold our first couple of bottles before we had stills back in um, 2013 um, on pre pre-sale on our website. Uh, and we sold them at 45 quid for the inaugural release. And when the inaugural release came out, they were 45 quid. And we never went above that um, for our flagship single malt. And we were always proud to kind of have it at that level. And who knows, it might even be a little bit lower in the future. We're basically looking at, you know, we to us, it's a wonderful thing to try and eventually make whiskey more reachable. And I've never liked, you know, sort of first releases that, um, you know, people put up at auction and sell at crazy prices and whatever, because it just doesn't really mean much if you can't buy it and drink it. Um, uh, so I think that's really important. Um, I will just quickly mention, you, know, you we brought up Lord Mayor's Reserve, and there's a funny story behind that for those who don't know. Um, our very first investor, uh, because we were out, you know, we've done a lot of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and um, getting investors. And uh, our first investor number one was really wonderful guy by the name of Peter Eslin, um, who at the time uh, worked at Barclays Bank in London. Um, 
and uh, he invested in, uh, at the time, if you invested, you got a barrel of whiskey and he invested enough to actually have three barrels of whiskey. Uh, and then he became sheriff of London and then a Lord Mayor of London. And when he knew he was gonna be become Lord Mayor, he phoned up and he said, I have this idea. Um, two of my three casts already passed their three years. Um, how about if we blend them together and we make something that I can sell for charity for Lord Mayor's appeal during my Lord Mayor year. So we made 691 bottles because he's the 691st Lord Mayor of London. And um, he sold a whole bunch of them during his Lord Mayor's year. And we had a couple of extras which were selling for him at the shop. Uh, but the two casks that he had that were over three years were bourbon and uh, STR. And his sherry cask that he owned wasn't yet three years, so we gave him one of ours. And um, so we were playing around with blends. So it's essentially a bourbon STR sherry blend. And the funny thing was um, that when we were playing with the blending, we had some good friends from Gordon and McPhail, basically the guys who run Gordon and McPhail, uh, who were down visiting the distillery. And they didn't know they were getting pressed into work. Um, but I, we said, come on into the whiskey blending room and you can taste some whiskeys and help us decide which which blend you like the best. And you know, last time, when I, you know, the only time I ever went to Gordon McPhail, they were giving me 1945 Glen Grant to taste. And so here I was saying, try my three-year-old and, you know, but they were actually really sweet and they were really impressed and they really liked it. And, um, and so that was the story behind Lord Mayor's Reserve. But that's, that too is a one-off. I don't know how many we have left. Not a whole lot. And when, when that's gone, it's gone, but it was just fun to do, you know, for Peter really. So mm. that's the story behind Lord Mayor's Reserve. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I kind of picked it up on a random to be fair, because uh, as I said earlier, my wife wanted that gin, the new uh, wildflower gin. Um, and I was like, well, even though I could have got the free delivery with just the gin, I was like, I'm going to treat myself as well. So I bought a bottle of that. Um, and you know, yeah, I mean, I barely touched it to be fair, but I need to crack into that and really, really get into it. Um, the peated cask was another uh, astounding one, because I remember two and a half years ago when I was speaking to you uh, on, on the interview I did last, um, you were telling me about this. Um, and I, I couldn't wait to try it. So I, I was literally just waiting on the website like this, like just release release bought that instantly um i had there was a question earlier i think i've already gone past about if you're planning on doing more peated casks um if i can dig that out yeah tony evans said it um yes where is that um but yeah, yeah so you absolutely we well yeah so i mean uh so first of all, the, the story behind the peated cask is a funny one, um, and it's a true story. It's basically that um, the idea came to us when uh, when we were, uh, oh, finish the next video, do we plan any? So we do uh, plan to have further peated releases, but it's there, at least as it stands now, it's gonna be the same one. Um, and that is basically our unpeated single malt spirit. Um, uh, aged, full term aged in ex Lafroy quarter casks. Um, the idea came to us because when Jim Swan first came to work with us, he suggested a type of yeast. Um, in addition to the anchor yeast we used, he suggested this yeast called Fermentus, which actually wasn't really easily findable in this country. And I said, Where do I find it? Um, you know, you're going to be here in like three days and you know, I got to order this in from France where it's made. He said, Oh, just. Um, just call the guys at Pandaren and, and they'll lend you 10 kilos. I was like, really? I mean, I don't know them. And they're like another distillery. They're competing. And that's the first time I realized how nice people were in this business. You know, distillers, like, you know, yeah, we compete sort of uh, on the shelves or whatever, but amongst each other, it's just a great business to be in. Really nice people. And I, I did call uh, John at Pandaren and said, you know, Jim Swan told me to call. Could I? you know, borrow 10 kilos of fermentous yeast, it arrived the next morning, next day delivery, uh, no payment or anything. So just bring, bring, you know, bring it back when you can, when you start ordering it. So we started actually using this, this yeast quite a bit. And we thought Nick and I, that we would um, go in person off to Wales to return the 10 kilos of yeast. So we could check out Pandaren, which we did. And John and Stephen Davis, super guys, um, we love them, um, showed us all around. And then they let us try this one edition, which had been, aged in a quarter cast. They had said that with them, it was by accident. They weren't aware that it was peated. I'm not sure I believe that. I think they kind of knew. But in any case, it was delicious and delightful. And we got back home and Nick and I turned to each other and said, should we try that? And so we called, at that point, we were getting our bourbons from Speyside Cooperage 
up in uh, Speyside, and they had these peated quarter casts. So we we literally we got one, one, and we put our new make into it, and we waited six months, and we tried it, saw how it was coming along, and we said, that's pretty damn good. Maybe we should go big. Let's buy two. <laughs> I mean, so literally, we were thinking so small at the time that, I mean, we went from one to two. What do you do with two? Then we went to four, and then we went to eight, and then we went to 20, I think. Now we're actually buying like 200 at a time, and we're now buying them direct from Beam Suntory, uh, who are getting them from Lefroy. So they're really fresh from, from Lefroy. Um, why do we do it? We don't do it. Uh, we still stick to the idea that our kind of our, our terroir, our, our sort of native taste is unpeated. I mean, you don't find peat bogs in the Cotswolds. It um, doesn't really, you know, uh, stand to reason that a Cotswold whiskey would be a peated whiskey by nature. And we don't have, you know, kind of big Braveheart complexes or whatever feel we have to come out with massive peat bombs or whatever. We do it simply because everything, I mean, our house style just has to be flavor forward. It's all about flavor. And if you find something that makes something that's a great flavor, then do it. And we were just blown away by this. The distillers um, had a great expression for it. They called it smoky vanilla ice cream because uh, it was just that little hint of smoke that made you think back to whiskeys that were more, you know, whiskey in that peated way, but not not too much to overwhelm the the what is a pretty delicate new make spirit. So what we've decided to do is we've decided to make that a core release. And by core, we mean we don't have a ton of it. Um, we have about a thousand bottles a month for the whole world. And that includes our shops and export and, you know, all over the place. Um, but we'll always have that. So if it's not available now, wait a few months and it'll become available. But I think we'll just keep doing that. Um, one thing we haven't done with peated casts, which I'm really eager to do, is blend with them. Mm. Because there's a little trick if you guys at home uh, are into playing around with blending, which I highly encourage. There's nothing more fun. Just go go out and do a tasting of six whiskeys and then start boshing them all together and seeing what you come up with. Um, but if you put like a few drops of a peated whiskey, no more, into an unpeated blend, it just does something fantastic. It creates just a kind of a little edge to it. Um, it really defines it and it changes it without even being noticeable as a peated malt. Um, so I think that there's a place for some of our peated quarter casks in future blends. Just to, and And we've done so little in the way of playing around with blending so far. Because if you think about our releases, okay, our flagship is a blend, but it's a straight 70-30 mix of two casks. Um, Founder's Choice, one type of cask. The Festival Release, one type of cask. Hearts and Crafts, one type of cask. Peter Gas, one type of cask. But what I'm really kind of looking forward to is when we start actually running out of types of casks, because we'll do, we'll do the full sherry this October. And then in October 21, we'll be releasing 100% bourbon cask. But so you heard it here first. That's kind of not public yet. But um, <laughs> sorry, marketing team. Um, I let the cat out of the bag. But um, but after 2021, that's kind of going to be it for our core expressions. So then we'll start to look at blends, and that's where the fun really begins because that's where you know you just the, the sky is a limit. Your imagination is a limit, really. And I would love to make something. I mean, I, one of my favorite whiskeys of all time was the Black Art, you know, um, from mm -hmm. Bukladi. And I just love that concept of just, you know, blending for taste in secret, kind of coming up with something that really surprises people and that might be different for each release. So, yeah, that's going to keep us busy for the next few years, we hope. Definitely, yeah. Well, it sounds like you've got a lot to play around with anyway. Um, I got some interesting questions um, earlier uh, uh, from uh, Amy again saying um, – do you think English whiskey should have a similar setup to the SWA? And that um, also uh, mirrors a question from uh, Multimission, a.k.a. Menno, who says that he uh, saw an article from three years ago saying that it was a possibility that we might start doing something like that. Um, like I know what my opinion of that would be, and I, I think it's brilliant, like, like you mentioned earlier, that you could just leave the port in the cask without having anybody knocking on your door. That's my favorite thing about non-Scottish whiskey is that you don't have the same rules uh, that are quite so stringent. Um, what do you think about that? Well, two very interesting and completely timely questions. Um, timely, especially because it's making me feel guilty because actually it's reminding me to do something that I haven't done yet. Um, and I'll tell you what that is. So. Um, 
I kind of was on two sides of the fence with it. I mean, when we started the distillery, we didn't really know how many English whiskeys distilleries there would be, and there's now about 25. Um, uh, and more and more people that I knew kind of in, in the business were sort of suggesting that maybe, you know, we should kind of have some sort of association or whatever. So anyway, we kind of took the lead and we decided to call a meeting on St. George's Day, what better day, last April 23rd, uh, of English whiskey distilleries, anybody who wanted to come and just chat. And it was going to be in, in London in this really cool uh, office uh, near, uh, uh, near uh, Westminster Abbey. And of course, we couldn't do that because of lockdown. So we all met on Zoom. And you can actually see a picture of it on my Facebook feed. I think I, I have it. We got 14 distilleries that ended up being able to come. And it was great. It was uh, really, really cool. Uh, the vibe was so good. Um, a lot of these guys knew one another, but a lot of them didn't. And they were meeting for the first time. And um, there was such a kind of a commonality. And just, again, like I said, distillers, when they meet other distillers, are really cool people. They really kind of... I mean, we're all, we all share so much. So I think everybody was of the opinion that it would be a good idea for us to get together, not necessarily with a Scotch Whiskey Association model, which obviously is very, very locked down. Um, and I think the feeling was that one of the important things about English whiskey is that there's a craft element to it that it would be a kind of a pity to lose. Um, but on the other hand, maybe it doesn't have to do with what kind of cast you can use, but maybe it has to do with you know, um, making sure that people, if English whiskey becomes a thing and catches on, that people don't bring in new make from that's not made in England, uh, have it sitting here for a year and call it English whiskey kind of thing. Um, and you know, there are things about what the SWA has done, which make a lot of sense. I mean, they've kept jobs in Scotland. I mean, you know, basically, you know, most English whiskey makers are pretty happy about English grain um, being part of their, you know, to, to talk to that, and we obviously are, because it's all Cotswolds grain, Cotswolds barley. Um, so what we're thinking is, is that basically we should have some kind of uh, association, alliance, guild, we're still trying to work out the name. Um, it should be focused on possibly creating some guidelines as to, you know, what English whiskey, you know, should be, but really not, not too constraining. And it should be about promoting awareness of the category. Um, and growing interest, uh, you know, people are more interested. There's more, I mean, this year we've had, I think, three or four new English whiskeys out, which is great. Um, and the qualities are really, really high. So I've always said to people, you know, what's English whiskey going to be like as a category? Pretty damn good is what I would say, because you'd have to be a little crazy to create a distillery from scratch right now and not be trying to make pretty good whiskey. Um, and so I think that, you know, um, I think that's that's going to be a really exciting thing to watch. And it's just the question spurred me into action because I, I owe everybody back an email. Just We have to kind of try. And, everybody is really busy right now, as you can imagine, um, just trying to keep going and all this crazy time. Um, uh, but we will try and come together and, um, you know, and, 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 and create a common voice to collectively promote this really interesting and exciting category. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, definitely something that I'm a, a big advocate of, obviously being English myself and now having not one, but maybe three or four distilleries that are within an hour or two of my of my house, which is astounding. You know, it, it would have been, you know, 10 years ago that I would have had to, to go to Scotland, uh, maybe to, I could probably have gone to Norwich, but anyone who knows the English motorways knows that Norwich is probably just as easy to get to as Scotland is from where I am. Um, but yeah, it's, I think that... Yeah it's a fantastic thing to be um to be part of right now with the with english whiskey getting better and better and like what you guys are doing is this kind of like quality at almost any expense kind of thing uh, we saw it with some other distilleries well i won't name but when they were starting out they were putting out some liquid that was it was okay but it wasn't like mind-blowing um or uh, it wasn't like superior quality and you kind of think to yourself well why why do i go to that instead of just going back to scotland that's what I would say is that that what, what you guys are doing and what other English distilleries need to do is um, just differentiate by by quality, like you know, the, proving that four years in the right cask can can produce something that's the same as something that's got a fifteen year old age statement on it. But you know, maybe for a bit more per bottle. Yeah. Very true. Mm. Um, we've had a yeah, a no, few... very 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 true. Um... No, sorry. Oh, go ahead. 
there's, yeah, there's a, there's a touch of the delay, I think. But um, I've got I've got a few European uh, viewers in today. Um, especially, I've got two, uh, one from Croatia and one from Norway, who are asking about um, potential availability. Now, I know you deliver to, to Norway, so the chat says, um, but Croatia not quite on the list yet. Um, I've, I've lost the question, so I can't put it up on the screen, unfortunately. Um, but the, the real question is, how's your expansion going? You know, do you have the stock to be able to push out worldwide? Yeah, we, we think it's a good question. We uh, we actually are in Norway now, um, from what I understand, and we're not in Croatia yet, although that would be uh, a, a great place to, to be. We are actually, we've expanded a lot more quickly than I would have expected. Um, and 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 um, we've got great you know folks in our sales group. But to be really fair, a lot of it was also people coming to us and saying we'd love to represent you in our countries and whatever. And um, we're now in forty countries uh, around the world. Um, so quite you know quite good spread across Asia, um, North America, um, all of Europe. Uh, well, not all of Europe because we're not in Croatia, but um, but a good part of Europe. Um, uh and uh well that's you know we haven't uh, i guess africa is limited to south africa where we have a distributor um but uh it, it's been it's been really good um and we have um in probably our two biggest export markets are in the us and in france and we actually have um permanent people there uh which is really important to help grow the brand um and uh uh, the U.S. is a really challenging market, um, just because, as you know, it's not one market; it's 50 different markets. Um, every state has its own set of regulations, and on top of it, there's this kind of system called the three-tier system, where you can't sell directly to shops or to consumers. You have to go through a distributor, um, and every state has slightly different rules. But one of the things that's really cool is that in the states, um, they are starting to grow. Uh, there's more now direct-to-consumer solutions on the internet. And we now are available for home delivery in six states in the U.S., which is pretty neat, um, including my home state of, of New York. Um, uh, and uh, and we think that that's really important in terms of whether there's enough stock to go around. I think that you know, given that we're not, you know, Scottish and Scotch still you know means uh, something to uh, a, a lot of a lot of folks. Um, the numbers I don't think are necessarily going to be kind of overwhelming. It's going to hopefully be, and I, this is how we would want it, to just be kind of slow and steady growth. And uh, um, you know, there's some countries which, uh, and and it's also interesting that remember we actually are known to a lot of folks actually more for our gin um, than for our whiskey. Um, and uh, sorry, that's the dog uh, barking, whose name is Whiskey, by the way. Um, so there's a delivery coming. Um, but um, uh, so, for example, interestingly, um, Japan is a country where I think, you know, there's a lot of promise because I think Japanese are very discerning. They care, as someone once said, more about what's inside the bottle than what's outside the bottle. It's not about the crystal decanter or those big numbers in terms of years. It's, it's really about the artisanal quality that goes into it. Um, but what's interesting is we've just started going into China, obviously not at a great time because China shut down right as we were starting. But um, I have really high hopes for China and in a way, maybe more for gin than for whiskey, because even though they are whiskey loving people, um, they are opening fancy cocktail bars at the rate of I don't know what every, you know, every city with over a million people is building you know, as, as a, a new five star hotel opening every month. Uh, and uh, they all want to have big great gin bars with celebrity bartenders and, and it's all about the gin. So, so there's different ways of growing in different parts of the uh, parts of the world. Um, and, uh, and we think that export is, in whiskey is going to be really important because again, as I always say, let's face it, England is a, Britain is a gin drinking nation largely. Um, and it's important to grow you know, all over the world. And uh, France, I think, is another one that's very typical of the kind of market that we do well in because people care about all those little extras that we kind of try and bring in in terms of the quality and the provenance and the terroir. And it's an interesting country because it's there's such a big independent off-trade. Uh, these little guys called the cavistes, as they say, every 
the, every town village in France has like three or four of these guys, and they're all really eager to hear your story. So that's why we hired somebody full time there to go around and tell that story five times a day, every day of the week at the, in a different town, sort of, and that's really helped. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's um, brought us up to an hour really quickly, actually, which has been um, wow. really, good, really good chat. Um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't look like uh, there's any more questions in the chat either, which is cool. I think I might have missed some, so sorry about that. I didn't plan to have a moderator in tonight, so um, trying to keep hold of the chat and uh, and talk to Dan at the same time is is challenging. So um, next time, I promise I'll get a moderator to help me with that. So sorry if I missed your question, but um, yeah, thanks very much for coming on, Dan. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you and to to go straight to the top to the CEOs is is, is awesome uh, and to get that insight. Um, I, uh, I remember actually, um, I know what you said earlier about uh, letting the cat out of the bag. Um, when, when I came to see you two and a half years ago and I did my interview for the channel then, um, we had uh, uh, one of the marketing team in the room with us. And at one point, I remember uh, Zoe, um, who I don't think works for you anymore, but yeah. she um, sat there, just, she just went like that. Like that. Um, yeah, after, yeah. You guys were brilliant and you didn't, you didn't make me cut anything. And it was just like, yep, just... Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I, I can't be trusted. I can't be let out too often, but I do enjoy it. And anybody who did have a question, um, you didn't answer, you're welcome to, uh, you know, post on Facebook or email me or whatever. And I hope that anybody who is interested in seeing more um, gets a chance to come by the distillery when we're reopen. We we hope in August. We don't know that yet, but just you know, keep an eye on our website and um, and definitely come on down. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, it's been a while since I've been down now, um, but um, I, I haven't even seen the new uh, the new bottling centre or the new visitor centre. So I need to come down oh and have my a God, man. you got to come down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll, when you guys open, I'll make sure I, I come down. But I imagine the queue for the um, getting tours is going to be expansive because it was already like a backlog of like eight weeks or something, wasn't it? So it's yeah, for weekends are tough. Midweek is a little bit better, um, but let's 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 see what what life brings us. But uh, actually, one thing here's another thing I'm going to spill the bag on. I think I may have already mentioned it, but um, hopefully by this weekend we will have a uh, virtual reality tour of the whole distillery. And even bits you don't see on the tour, like our bottling hall, our labs, our blending rooms. Um, uh, and uh, actually, they were just doing that today, filming that at the distillery. And they think they'll have it online by the end of the week. So check out our website over the weekend, and you can actually walk yourself through the whole place, even if you can't come in person right now. That's really cool. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I said I must come down. I must come down and see things. Because I remember I came down and did one of your bottling angel things once. Um, yeah. And it, it was below the stills in this little tiny room um and and, and yeah. nobody else it was really funny it was on a friday nobody else turned up so i did it was just me doing all all, all the stations like that for about four hours it was really good fun wow right? well done <laughs> yeah, yeah that's that's so carry on Dan. Yeah, we, we 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 um you know what what you're talking about so basically for the first three years all of our gin was bottled by volunteers who were paid in gin um, uh, they weren't paid, but they were given a bottle of gin for in exchange for a, a shift. Um, and then uh, we had uh, our, our FD, our finance director, started with us, and he said, "You know, you can't do that. That's like you know, HMRC won't like that because that's you know that's barter, that's you know payment in kind. You know uh, they like their national insurance." But, so we had to stop, um, and it was a pity because we had about 500 people who were on the list, and uh, they were really nice folk and they really enjoyed it and it was a great kind of a community sort of activity um, but now we have a wonderful equally wonderful team of paid bottlers who work with us every day and they're great and uh, everything is manual everything is done at the distillery um, they don't get you know huge throughput through but they're really good at switching uh, from one product to another so they might be doing gin on a Tuesday whiskey on a Wednesday uh, cream liqueur it just everything it just changes all the time which is really nice but uh, but uh, if you came back Again, to visit us, we might let you bottle a few bottles just for all time. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be in touch with that one then. But yeah, so okay. thank you very much for coming on, Dan. Um, hopefully everyone's enjoyed the stream. Um, uh, I uh, will hopefully have Dan on again in the future. If not, hopefully in person, I'll be able to come down. And um, yeah, carry on putting out great stuff because uh, you know, great. life in me, and I'll continue enthusing about you. Um, looking forward to the next thing always. Cheers, Vin. Thank you again. Cheers. All the Thanks. best. Uh, apologies if Take I missed you. Everybody. Feel free to email me. Cheers, Cheers. everybody. Thank you.